Excellent. All right, backup. Mr. Dwight, if you could take us off. Backup is rolling. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on a committee on economic development. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place our cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you, gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our committee hearing on EDC. Uh, we shall hope we have had a wonderful Valentine's Day and everyone's been safe. And unfortunately, the shovel's ready for one more snowstorm tomorrow. I think it's the last one. My back is done. Kids back in college. I've got no help anymore. So we've been joined by council members Kalos, Joe Nye, and Lewis. And as other council members come in, we will uh, announce them and give them a chance to speak on today's hearing on oversight and helicopter legislation. Uh, good day, because it's been years in the making, and I'd like to thank everyone that's going to participate today, testify, especially with all the hard work that EDC has done and joining with us on this topic that we have gotten to today. So, good morning. Today is Wednesday, February 17th. I am Council Member Paul Bloom, Chair to the Committee on Economic Development, and I want to start off by thanking the members of our committee. As I mentioned, we have Kalos, Jonai, and Lewis with us today, and there'll be others coming. Today, we will be hearing three important pieces of legislation that we hope will mitigate helicopter noise and safety concerns for all New Yorkers while working collaboratively with an industry that provides jobs and living for us. Helicopter noise is a persistent aggravating issue for so many residents in our city, from any district, in, from especially my district in Northeast Queens to the west side of Manhattan. And we need to do more to get things under control with the limited tools that we have at our disposal. We have seen a massive surge in helicopter noise complaints over this just past year. In November, the city published an analysis of helicopter noise complaints to 311 that found that complaints have increased by more than 130% over the past year compared to 2019. This increase can be attributed to many factors, including being people being more aware of noise while working from home, an increase in flights in New Jersey, and a use of NYPD helicopters during the protests in June. Whatever the reason, the fact of the matter is, New Yorkers are still having their quality of life diminished by incessant noise from helicopters. Because I always like to provide a little bit of background before we get into the hearing. There are currently three publicly owned heliports in the city that are available for public use. The Downtown Manhattan Heliport, DMH, the East 34th Street Heliport, and the West 30th Street Heliport. They work as a system. DMH focuses on tourist flights. The East 34th Street focuses on corporate traffic and the West 30th Street focuses on charter and corporate traffic. The city has made efforts to regulate the helicopter industry in New York all the way back to the Giuliani administration, when the city put restrictions on flights out of the 34th Street heliport and commenced the heliport and helicopter master plan study. In 2016, after our very city council hearing on the issue, EDC and the helicopter industry came together to work out a new agreement to significantly reduce the impact of tourist helicopters flying from city heliports. Among other things, this new agreement banned tour flights from DMH, DMH on Sundays, reduced the amount of tour flights by 50%, banned tour flights over Governor's Island, required monthly reporting on tourist flights and air quality, and required the uh, con concessionaires to actively research technology to mitigate helicopter noise, reduce emissions, and promote fuel efficiency and implement that technology as it becomes available. That agreement is still in effect today. In recent years, we have also seen new technological developments in the helicopter industry that will eventually make helicopters climb. In 2014, the FAA issued regulations that require all new helicopter designs to meet stage three noise levels, the most quiet standard yet. There is also exciting work being done on developing electric helicopters, which like electric cars are very quiet and environmentally friendly. That brings me to the three bills I'm sponsoring that we'll be hearing today. Intro number 2026 would establish regulated regulations pertaining, pertaining to noise emission for helicopters using city-owned heliports. Specifically, all helicopters taking off and landing at city-owned heliports would be required to meet stage three noise emission standards as established by the FAA. 
Introduction number 2027 would require DCAS to conduct a study on the safety and feasibility of replacing the city's helicopter fleet with electric powered vehicles. Finally, intro 2067 would require the EDC to collect certain safety and route information regarding hel helicopters operating on city property and submit the information to the council on an annual request basis. A lot of work has been getting has gone to get us where we are today, and I'm looking forward to discussing these bills, as well as the next phase of helicopter noise mitigation in our city. This litigation will help us better control what goes in and out of our heliports. And I also want to recognize the limitations here. We do not have control of the helicopters coming into our airspace from places like New Jersey. We must work with sister jurisdictions to mitigate this noise for problems for everyone in this region. Uh, that's something we will bring up in today's hearing. Um, so many of the current complaints, because our partners here have worked so well to, to voluntarily get us where we are, there are a lot of folks that are not doing that, that are not coming from New York City. A lot of work has gone into that, and I'm very proud of everyone. We have representatives from EDC, DCAS here today, as well as a wide range of advocates and industry voices that I'm eager to hear from, as well as everyone who has took the time to send an email, call me at the district office, or just overall vent. And there's been a lot of venting over the years I've been chair over this. So before I turn it over, I'd like to take a moment to thank committee staff, legislative counsel, Josh Kingsley, policy analyst, Emily Ford Jones, and finance analyst, Malia Ali, for all their hard work putting this hearing together today. With that, I'd like to turn over my colleague, colleague council member, Ben Kalos, to make an opening statement as he's joining in on today's talks. Council member Kalos, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, to Economic Development Committee Chair Paul Vallone for your leadership in authoring legislation to take on helicopter noise. When I saw introduction 2026, I was moved to sign on as the second co-sponsor to set strict limits on the noise generated by helicopters that take off from New York City. Helicopter noise is such a big problem that it might better be call us noise, New York City. Uh, if 301 is any indication, residents are tired of all the noise. In fact, they've started groups like Stop the Chop. When Trump was elected and the 57th Street Commercial Corridor became a no-fly zone, all air traffic ended up fo following a new route over residential neighborhoods in the East and West 80s and 90s, where hundreds of thousands of people live, uh, including me. Helicopters are so frequent and so loud when they fly over my home and neighborhood that my daughter learned how to say copter before car. Just link, let that sink in, that helicopters were more present in her environment than cars uh, or buses or trains, that she, her first words were among them was copter before anything else. Complaints to 301 about helicopter noise are hovering above New York soared last year by more than 130% over 2019. And that includes the four month period where helicopter flight tours were banned in New York City. Um, and I, I just have to say it has gotten so loud um, that I've even installed an app because I, I couldn't actually believe that uh, uh, the helicopters uh, we're following the laws. So I, I actually installed uh, uh, Flight Radar 24 on my phone. And uh, let me just see that you, you can literally see a helicopter right now over Manhattan. Uh, it just doesn't ever stop. Uh, we've worked on this issue with Borough President Gail Brewer on the Helicopter Task Force. Uh, we've also um, been working with EDC FAA, Helicopter Council, Hudson River Trust, uh, I want to thank our Congress members, Maloney and Nadler, um, and I, uh, I'm just so supportive of this legislation, to, and I hope we will pass introduction 2026 uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Chair Vallone. Let's get it done. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos, and I think that flight app download just went through the roof, <laughs> especially if it's, it's helping our little ones to, to track these flights that are, are, are basically pillaging through our neighborhoods. Uh, and you're right, we've had a federal, state, and local support on this. And Councilmember Kalos, and I know you, and Helen Rosenthal, and Margaret Chin, and the first term all worked very hard to 
to get the original pieces of legislation and agreements done. Uh, and Congress members Maloney, uh, Nadler, and in my neck of the woods, Tom Swazi, who got the FAA to sit down and actually change the flight route path over the Northeast coast to minimize and mitigate it over all the boroughs, which is all we really ask. We want to make sure we can mitigate this. I'd like to turn it over to our legislative council, CJ, for some procedural and swearing in. CJ, for you. Thank you, Chair. I am CJ Murray, and I will be serving as committee counsel for today's hearing. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to testify today will be EDC Aviation Director Adam Lomazny and DCAS Chief Fleet Officer Keith Kerman. In addition, from EDC, Assistant Vice President Jervon Singletary and Assistant Vice President of Asset Management Bianca Sosa will be available to answer questions. Panelists, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath to all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions. Please raise your right hands. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Lomazny. I do. Chief Fleet Officer Kerman. I do. Assistant Vice President Singletary. I do. Assistant Vice President Sosa. I do. Thank you. Director Lomazny, you may begin your testimony. Quickly, I wanted to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Barron. Good morning, Council Member Barron, and I hope you have some questions. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, good morning, Chairman Ballone and members of the Economic Development Committee. My name is Adam Lamessini, and I serve as Assistant Vice President of Transportation, as well as the Director of Aviation for NYC EDC. Uh, today, I'm joined by Javon Singletary, Assistant Vice President in our Government and Community Relations Division, and Bianca Sosa, uh, Assistant Vice President for Asset Management. I'm pleased to testify on interest 2026 and 2067, which seek to address helicopter issues in the city. After my testimony, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Um, as uh, Chairman Ballone spoke, and as you may know, the city has three public use heliports in operation, two of which are owned by the city, the East 34th Street heliport and the downtown Manhattan heliport, known as DMH, and the third heliport on West 30th Street uh, is managed by the Hudson River Park Trust. These three public use heliports in Manhattan are critical components of our city's transportation infrastructure. They operate as nodes that plug into a larger transportation system with the East 34th Street heliport and West 30th Street heliport focused on charter and corporate traffic and DMH focused on tourism. The East 34th Street heliport is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays and is closed on weekends. The downtown facility is open for tours from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. No tour flights are allowed on Sunday. Corporate and charter flights are allowed from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but they represent a small percentage of overall traffic. Town. The downtown Manhattan heliport is also unique in that it is the only facility that can accommodate military helicopters used for presidential visits because of the size and physical layout. EDC's role with the heliports is pursuant to the maritime contract between the city and EDC. The city has retained EDC to engage in various activities intended to promote the economic development of the city's waterfront property and related transportation facilities, which includes the two city-owned heliports. It's for that reason EDC over, oversees the heliport facilities and therefore acts as a contract administrator through the concession agreements which are entered into between um, New York City Department of Small Business Services, SBS, and the concessionaires. The day-to-day -day management of heliport operations is handled by our concessionaires, Atlantic Aviation at East 34th Street and Saker Aviation at the downtown Manhattan heliport. The concession agreements define the terms and conditions of how each facility may operate. These agreements define matters such as hours of operation, maximum annual flight volumes, insurance levels, reporting requirements, and terms of payment, among other items. 
In its dual role in promoting economic development and waterfront activation, EDC has always sought to balance the need of maintaining these critical pieces of infrastructure and the negative noise impacts that helicopters can cause. In 2016, Mayor de Blasio, the City Council, and EDC worked with the local helicopter industry, the downtown Manhattan heliport operator, tour flight companies, and the Federal Aviation Administration to collaboratively reduce the number of tour flights operating out of DMH by approximately 50%. This agreement also, also limited tour flights over lands, including Governor's Island, Staten Island, and the route to Yankee Stadium over northern Manhattan. This agreement also operations. As a result, these efforts have, have eliminated approximately 50,000, excuse me, 30,000 tour flights annually. This agreement also requires a consultant to monitor complaints from the 311 system that may be related to tour flights originating out of the downtown Manhattan Hallow. Through this effort, Larger helicopter complaint data received through 311 has been analyzed on a monthly basis and categorized by likely origins such as NYPD flights, tour flights originating out of DMH, tour flights originating, originating outside of New York City, and other types of flights. EDC also tracks through, through, through the 311 system complaints made about helicopters. Most of the complaints the city receives tend to reference helicopters that are hovering over or flying over other areas of the city not around the two city-owned heliports and not identified as originating out of the either city-owned heliports. Due to the pandemic, flights dropped to less than 5% of the previous year at DMH and less than 20% at East 34th Street since spring 2020. They are now at about, they are now at about 10% and 40% of 2019 levels for both heliports respectively. However, with more people staying home, we've seen an increase in 311. In 2018, the previous agreement for East 34th Street Heliport was nearing its expiration date. Upon notification and various consultations with Councilmember Vallone, Community Board 6, and the Manhattan Borough President's Office, as prescribed in the applicable procurement rules, EDC commenced the solicitation process for a new concession agreement. After proposal evaluations, interviews, and negotiations, the city, with EDC as contract administrator, entered into a new concession agreement with Atlantic Aviation in 2019 for a period of up to 10 years. Through the agreement, Atlantic is responsible for capital improvements, maintaining the heliport in a safe and clean manner, monitoring air quality at the heliport, reporting on flight operations, complaints received, and any off-hours off flights. Additionally, it'll Atlantic is responsible for ensuring compliance with any FAA standards and regulations, including regular safety reporting and sharing any FAA filings with EDC. They have also committed to work directly with the Manhattan Borough President's Office Task Force and other city agencies on noise mitigation and community concerns. It's important to note that while EDC strives to be a partner in addressing noise mitigation issues, we ultimately have limited control in regulating or incentivizing the industry at large. That is because the FAA has the sole authority to regulate U.S. civilian airspace and therefore establishes rules and restrictions for its use. This means that the FAA has the sole authority, not states or localities, to approve matters such as aircraft design standards, safety procedures, flight paths and altitudes, as well as the designation of airports and heliports. The authority also extends to adopting standards for mitigating aircraft noise. Aircraft noise is categorized by various stages, which are determined internationally by the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO adopted nationally by the FAA, and ultimately applied towards an aircraft upon acquiring its airworthiness certificate. These standards require that the aircraft meet or exceed designated noise thresholds. For helicopters, three different stages of noise exist, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage three is the most recent standard after being created by the ICAO and adopted by the FAA on March 4, 2014. Newly designed helicopter models certified after that date must meet the quieter stage three standard. Aircraft currently operating under heliports are almost entirely stage two helicopters. While stage three is quieter and would significantly address the noise concerns that communities have, these types of helicopters are unfortunately not widely commercially available at this time, nor has the FAA published any formal plans for the phase out of stage one and stage two helicopters from operation. Uh, so going to the legislation. Uh, intro 2026 would prohibit stage one and stage two charter helicopters from landing and taking off at city managed heliports. We have concerns about the practicality of this bill. First, the vast majority of helicopters currently in operation are categorized as stage one and stage two, and this bill would effectively ban them from using the city's public use heliports. Moreover, as I mentioned a few moments ago, FAA regulations prescribe the procedures and limitations for states and localities that seek to adopt noise mitigations restrictions. Intro 2067 
would require EDC to collect airworthiness certificates, air registration certificates, recent aircraft inspection reports, origin route, and planned destination routes. Under the East 34th Street Heliport Concession Agreement, EDC already receives monthly flight logs for the following information. Operations that detail an aircraft tail or registration number, the make and model, the operator of the aircraft if known, the number of passengers on board, the date and time in and out, and origin and destination if known. Pilots are already required to present airworthiness certificates to the FAA upon request. As it pertains to the heliports, the collection and storage of documents by EDC, such as airworthiness certificates or aircraft inspection reports, does not seem appropriate because EDC is not a federal aviation authority, but rather a contract administrator acting on behalf of the city. Regarding the air registration certificates, the operator does report aircraft tail or registration number indicating each aircraft is registered. Regarding routes taken and planned routes, Pilots are not required by the FAA to file flight class prior to takeoff, and therefore we believe the requirement would be unenforceable by NYC EDC. As a matter of course, we report to the city council, community boards, and borough president on the operations of heliports. For the downtown Manhattan heliport, we send a monthly report that details the number of allowed and actual tour flights, in addition to a report that details the type of 311 complaints received. For the East 34th Street heliport, we send a quarterly report that details the total number of flights and complaints received by the operator. To date, we have partnered with several of your offices and will continue to work with you in these conversations about noise. We recently participated in the Manhattan Borough President's Helicopter Task Force, and we were truly encouraged by the level of collaboration that included representatives from the FAA, Eastern Region Helicopter Council, elected officials from across the Hudson, and communities that discussed ways to address the issue. Moreover, EDC is committed to being a partner in this effort and is available to participate in any working groups that might be convened with the FAA on this issue. Thank you for your attention today and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Director. I will now turn it over to questions from the chair. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. A reminder to Chair Vallone, you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourself during this period. Chair Vallone, please begin. Just, just checking, did we want DCAS to testify now or after questions from TI? It's understanding that I thought DCAS was going to testify now. Would you like to? I think it would kind of make sense if we had uh, most of the questions kind of, I, I would be okay if, if Department of Citywide Administrative Services testified now, or would you like to just to question EDC now? I think we should put them together. Is DCAS on now? We want to do a testimony. I believe I see you. So why don't we unmute um, DCAS so that they can testify at this point? Hang on one second. I'm working to get that done. Hang in there, Keith. <laughs> as soon as we get you unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, there you go. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Thank you to the committee. Um, glad to be here with you today. Um, my name is Keith Kerman, and I'm a Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services and New York City's Chief Fleet Officer. Thank you for allowing me to testify and discuss Intro 2027 regarding a study of the electric vertical takeoff and lift sector, EVTOL, or in simple language, electric helicopters. In February, 2020, Mayor de Blasio signed Executive Order 53, committing New York City to transition to an all electric fleet by 2040. We are already making important progress with over 2,800 plug-in units and over 1,000 electric chargers. Just recently, DCAS announced the completion of phase one of our fast charging initiative with 61 fast chargers now complete for city fleet units, including three with public access, Midland Beach and Ocean Breeze facility in Staten Island and Randall's Island Park in Manhattan. And we hope to open more of those. We already have sedans, SUVs, minivans, crossovers, off-road and other fleet units with plug-in capacity. And DCAS will be establishing contracts for many additional types of vehicles in 2021, including small garbage trucks for parks, electric, electric pickups, electric vans, and electric small work trucks. 
We will also be working to test and develop electric units for policing, sanitation, and fire. In time, we also wanna see our aviation units join in this clean energy fleet transition. New York City currently operates nine helicopters. The NYPD has seven helicopters, four of which are used for patrol, two for air and sea rescue, and one for training. These are operated by the NYPD Aviation Unit operating out of Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn. DEP and HELP also have aviation units with both currently operating one aircraft. The health department uses their helicopter in disease control operations such as West Nile virus management, while the DEP unit is used for law enforcement in the upstate reservoir. The health department unit is located at, in Suffolk County and based in Suffolk County and the DEP unit in Dutchess County, New York, upstate. The city uses over 185,000 gallons of jet fuel annually procured through DCAS to power the existing helicopter fleet. There has been, as it been, was mentioned, early market research, testing and development of electric aviation units, both manned and unmanned. DCAS looks forward to researching these op options further, meeting with vendors and regulators in this area and reporting our findings as to the state of the market, battery charging issues and regulatory concerns. EVTOL holds the promise of zero emissions and low noise aviation units and other related developments, including possible autonomous operation. Advances in electric battery capacity and density will be critical to the successful introduction of these options. We look forward to exploring this new area of electrification with you while continuing to grow our vehicle electric electrification efforts in the fleet side as well. Um, thank you for inviting us to join you today and we're happy to answer any questions. So Keith, thank you for that. Since you just testified, I mind if we just start real quick with some questions for you so we can clarify. So I love the ending <laughs> where you like to hold the promise of zero emissions and low no noise aviation units. Um, just wanted to get like where we are today versus when you envision that happening. So how many total helicopters are in the fleet that DCAS manages and controls? Well, the city fleet, like I mentioned, has nine helicopters. Seven of them, are, I'm sorry? We only have nine helicopters? We have not yet, that's it. Seven helicopters of the police department. And of course that's a police, you know, emergency operation that is managed by the police department. You know, DCAS is not involved in the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, security and policing services related to that. Well, who, do you, does DCAS purchase the NYPD's helicopters or is that their own budget? Their own? No, we purchase the health and so health and DP go through DCAS contracts. The police department does the procurement directly because they are doing that, that spec is completely exclusive to the police department. And of course, as in vehicle fleets, there are different specification requirements for policing helicopters have much more um, extensive requirements at an operational level, at an engine level um, than the not than civilian helicopters. So DCAS has been doing the procurement for the civilian helicopter fleet, which is really DEP and health. And then the police department has been doing the specifications and procurement directly for their, their law enforcement fleet. So are any of those helicopters stage three or is there a plan at some point to upgrade them to stage three? You know, I would need to check in on that, on that issue because we were not, um, the civilian helicopters would, and one of them was recently procured. So would adhere to the up-to-date up standards. I need to, I would need to check in on the policing. There are sometimes, and I'm just not certain because we did not do the specs for these. Um, there are sometimes law enforcement exemptions. I'm not aware that there is one, but I'm not sure there isn't. So we can check on that on the stage at three issue for the, the helicopter fleet. Yeah, yeah, that would be helpful. I, I certainly don't want to get in the way of, of what is required for the helicopter NYPD to keep us safe. I'm sure they have different levels of protection on their helicopters versus a civilian one. Um, so the maintenance of those helicopters, does that also go through DCAS or is that handled individually by it's NYPD? Or? All done, so all done out of for NYPD, everything's out of Floyd Bennett Field. You know, that's a very contained operation. Um, it's been in Floyd Bennett Field um, for decades. And, and, you know, obviously aviation is a very specialized field. So 
we are not doing them. Those are not city mechanics. Um, that we're not, that's not part of the automotive repair operation. Um, so, really so, so how do you get updates or reporting on whether that, that maintenance is done to accept acceptable standards or that they're up to date? Do we have any recording coming out of that? That would seem to me that would be something that I would want if I do. Again, that we would have to, I, I, you know, I'm very confident in the police department's, you know, maintenance program. I and mean, we obviously work with the police department maintenance program across their 10,000 fleet pieces. That is a very specific specialized operation locating out of Floyd Bennett Field. So we would have to go to the police department for maintenance records. Um, that is, uh, again, a very contained operational unit from everything else we do, right? So DCAS works with the police department every single day for all the 10,000 vehicles and trucks, the emergency service trucks. And However, the, the helicopter unit is very, very um, contained and defined and, and, and managed directly. Well, you also ended the testimony by, you know, the promise of hopefully going more green as we go forward in the future, whether it's electrification or through different stages. What, what in your vision would a time like, like that look like? Is there, is there a, a contract or a time for when the city fleet is due to be revamped or repurchased? Like how long is a, is a city helicopter life in the city before it's replaced and put into another one? And when we do replace it, at that point, can we then replace it the next stage or an electrification model? You know, it depends on the development of this marketplace. And, and that's true of electrification in general. So, I mean, the good news is we've seen extraordinary development in electrification in general, right? And 20, um, just 15 years ago in 2006, they literally wrote a movie that said, who killed the electric car? And it was a nice documentary, an extraordinarily premature obituary. Now we are seeing electrification explode. We are seeing electric cars, electric trucks. We're seeing extraordinary commitments. President Biden just committed for the entire city federal fleet, 600,000 vehicles to, to move to electric. We're also seeing the early aspects of that in um, vertical and, and takeoff vehicles. And, and you know, some of that is developing in looks like an electric helicopter. And there've been tests about five years ago, I believe in California was the first United States test of a viable electric helicopter, limited range, but successful test. There's a lot of development that is, that is structured on the concept of drones on yeah. multi on multi rotor equipment. Those sound extent. interesting for our, our future, and I, I I'd totally be ready for that implementation, and I and I appreciate that. Um, and I think that sounds like a next topic for for how we can transition to different but less intrusive technology. So I thank you for that, and thank you for clearing up the, the current city fleet and the contracts. I'd like to switch over to Adam now, uh, EDC, after your testimony. So. It's been a, a good journey over the years together, working with your team and EDC. Um, I would have to say we used the term wild, wild west uh, way back in 2015 and 2016 because there really wasn't anything in place. And, and it was, I think, quite shocking to all of us that we as the city, as the ultimate landlord, were just saying FAA is in control and that we didn't have it. And that changed. In 2016, we, we had the first genesis of this hearing, and there was work together that we worked with the uh, our contracts and those who were operating their fleets and our helipads and we worked with the city and we even worked with the FAA to get that 50 percent reduction um, in the tourism industry and now we've been trying to continue that fight with the charter industry and that's why we talked about city on flights because for the average citizen in New York we don't know unless you have the Ben Kalos app on which helicopter is flying over, we just know there's noise. So as, as probably one of the top three complaints that I've gotten in my district office over my eight years, that's why I'm very happy we've gotten to today's place where we have these three additional fills. Um, I, I just wanna take you to your, your testimony. Um, and, and you say, which is important for everyone to understand, the day-to-day -day management of heliport operations is handled by the concessionaires. And you list the three, Atlantic Aviation, Saker Aviation, and Downtown Manhattan Heliport. EDC enters into those concession agreements with them, correct? That's correct. So you're drafting the concession agreements that bind the three operators? 
Uh, yes, and just to clarify, it's it's the two operators. It's uh, Saker at downtown Manhattan. How Saker, hey, that's right, because Thirty Fourth Street is the state. Mm -hmm. That that has always been my starting point at the hearings because I don't like to just, especially for those listening in, say it's an FAA situation because it is and it isn't, and that's where we got to today. If if I am the city and I am charging EDC to enter into contracts with these heliports that fly over our jurisdiction, then it is EDC. And that's, and that's where we've gotten to change the conversation a little bit to say that we are responsible because we're the ones handing out those concession agreements. So on the concession agreements, can you give me an update with the two that we have with Saker and downtown Manhattan? Where are we in the current timeline of, I know there might've been an extension with each one, what's left in the current operating agreement and what, when it's due for renewal? Sure. And you know what? I'd actually like to defer to uh, my colleague, Bianca Sosa, uh, who's the asset manager who can give you a sure. decent answer on that. All you, Bianca. Good morning. I think we just got to get you unmuted there. I still see the red microphone mute button. If we can unmute Bianca. And by the way, I see, just a clarification, council members Barron, Joan I, Koo, um, that are with us, also Lewis, and if any of the council members want to ask questions right after this, right after these questions with EDC, we'll jump right to the council members because this is relevant in so many of their districts. Are we good to go with Bianca? Not yet. So if we can get Bianca unmuted. Um, Let's see, I'll, I'll wait up this year. Got it, thank, thank you so much. Um, and good morning, everyone. So um, yes, for East 34th Street, we did, uh, the city just entered into a new concession agreement in 2019. So that concession agreement is up to 10 years. Um, the expiration date would be September, 2028. And then the downtown Manhattan heliport, currently the extension, sorry, the expiration is April, 2022. And there's one option year left on that agreement. So we've got that one to 2023 as a maximum date, right? And another one's 2023. Right. In, in those agreements, we were able to work together to get a lot of the concessions that we have today. Do, can we look forward to, or can we have a conversation that in the next round of negotiations, that these pieces of legislation are at least the standards that are being developed in the industry? Can we look forward to those being part of the new concession agreements so that we could, in the RFP, that at least we always had a good guy clause type approach that some of the operators may voluntarily give us these additional concessions so that they get the contract. I'm just hoping that that is something we can continue so that we can mitigate what's happening in the stocks. Is that something that we can maybe see what you envision with the next round? Yes, I think that we, we would definitely be more than happy to work with you all in our last procurement. Um, in 2019 and 2018 with, with East 34th Street, we worked with the council to include, you know, different requests of, of additional information um, into that new concession agreement. So with the existing concession agreements, then what is what is the revenue that's generated for EDC at both that point? Sure, sure. Total um, combined, it's about, well, during COVID it has been less, but um, about two to three million per year. And I think prior to COVID, it was about five million. That's correct. I remember the last year. That was the number that stood out. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't. Pre-COVID revenue generation, yes. I believe, was about five million. Correct. Correct. So it's been cut in half. Um, and how many of those flights? I guess today, uh, it's a little tough in the, in the COVID world. But how many flights do you have? records of how many flights now are, are coming out of those two helipads versus pre-COVID? Sure, so um, in 2020, the total number um, was just around 6,000 flights, um, which represents about a 90% drop from 2019, which was about 35,000 flights. Okay, so based on those numbers has the the amount of flights in your eyes, when we start to emerge back out of the COVID world we're in, I would think hopefully toward the end of the year, um, do you expect to go back to the previous previous numbers? I think it's kind of a function of 
you know, different external factors, um, you know, yeah, economic recovery, tourism, people traveling again. Um, but I would imagine just as their tourism industries or other, you know, airline industries, when they, they um, recover, they, yeah, they I'm, have, I'm having, having a little trouble. Airlines. Could be around 53, but I'm having a little trouble hearing you. So if we can maybe with the mic or maybe just a little closer. Sure. Perfect. Sure. I think I think we would expect it to follow a similar recover recovery timeline as you know the, the general aviation industry. So with those flights that are coming in and out, do we know how many of those helicopters are stage three helicopters? And is that just through a voluntary basis or is that through per the concession? So our understanding is there's only one or two helicopters um, that fly around New York City that are stage three. Well, yeah. When you say fly around New York City, what, what does that mean? Right, that land at um, the city-owned helicopters. Okay, and, and when those city-owned helicopters, well, when those helicopters are landing, what are they providing to you on the law and operation and use at this point? Sorry, may you repeat the question? When a helicopter lands in one of our two helipads that are contracted through EDC, what data are you receiving from the helicopter industry on a daily basis that tells you how many flights are landing, leaving, and what, what standards they are complying with. Is any information being provided to you? Sure. You. So the, the heliport operators, they they um, kind of they take record of, of you know which helicopter is landing. Um, as I think Adam had stated in his testimony, we we they note the time um, that they land, the passengers, the type of aircraft it is, the owner if known, um, and the tail number. And those are just daily records. And is any of that based on requirements that come from EDC or are you just following FAA guidelines? We, I think in, in the concession agreement for the new, um, for East 34th Street in the concession agreement, they have, uh, that, that was negotiated through, through feedback from council that we can, that they provide that information to EDC, um, those daily flight logs. So that was something that we worked together um, to receive. And now we can track that that also. Right. Is there a real-time tracking a, a option now that we can see what's coming in on a daily basis? We received the reports after the month is over. And I believe we've also in implemented a tracking option there also too, which has been quite helpful for folks to see who's who and what is flying uh, above our schedule. But something you said there is important. That is through the last concession agreement, through the contractual conversations, it was something that was agreed upon. So, and I and I also like to give a shout out to the, to the folks that are gonna testify afterwards. A lot of this has been voluntarily being provided at this point based on whether it's a, a piece of legislation that's coming forward or a negotiation of a contract. Um, and a, a lot of the victories that we've gotten to today have been done through that negotiation process. So uh, I, I've never wanted to sit back and say it's an FAA situation because yes, we can't say what's happening over our airports, but I'd be damned if somebody tells me what can happen over the skies here in New York City without us telling them what it is. And that's exactly what's happened. So for those who are, who are learning um, and, and wanting to know what that process is, it has been negotiated and been voluntarily mitigated to get to a point where we are today. These three pieces of legislation will now uh, memorialize that and take it further and mandate it on an annual basis because prior to 2016, we weren't getting any of that. It's just a high in the sky request. And maybe we got information and I had nothing to bring back to people of the district as did any of the council members. Um, I'd like to give our council, committee council, a chance to acknowledge any of the council members that have their hands up or would like to speak at this point. I know some. I know Councilman Barron, Councilman Chin wants to. So, on this, is anyone now that would like to ask their questions? And then we can. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on Council members in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You will have a total of five minutes to ask your question, receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, Please wait until the sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your questions. And Chair Valone, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. So if you'd like to continue your questioning. Well, that's not, 
Like, come on, you guys just let leaving me to do all the questions. All right, not a problem. Um, I know we're going to have the Stop the Chop and the Advocates on later, so we have questions for them. And also the helicopter industry has also provided um, some of those, and as a committee, we will post online. I know Blade has also given a presentation of some of the current maps that are being used, which are quite helpful to see uh, the footprint over the skies of New York City, uh, what's actually happening. I, I think I'd like EDC to kind of sum up for them. Um, what steps on, on your side would you like to see, would you like to see be the next step for the concession agreements and for the next evolution of, of green initiatives and safety in our skies? Because obviously New York City is not happy with the noise. We are not generating an income from this industry to me that, that, would, that mitigates the quality of life impact versus what we're getting as revenue. And when you balance that, then it becomes and why we even doing it in the first place. So it's it's tough to go back to folks in your community saying, look at the great benefit that we're getting as a city. I, I don't see it. I've never seen it. Um, I don't see the income that's being generated to allow it. But to allow that industry to continue, where do you envision the helicopter industry going in, in the next contract, in the concessions that are coming up, and what you can voluntarily mitigate these consequences? Sure, Council Member, and we certainly appreciate the question. Um, I mean, we certainly you know, want to see um, the greening of the industry and recognize that the issues that there are. So we're supportive. Um, you know, of all efforts, including our friends at DCAS, of trying to green the fleet, um, you know, overall. So that's, you know, one thing we do want to say we're supportive of. Um, one of the things I want to point out also that, that you were mentioning is, you know, the partnership we've had with, over the past um, with the council and the industry to have the existing agreements we do today um, allows us a certain level, um, you know, for lack of a better word, control over the tour operators that, you know, now um, our limits to do, you know, certain flight paths versus some of the other um, heliports that are not in New York City, say across the river in New Jersey or other places that don't have similar restrictions. So the benefit of having them here allows us to have those negotiations and concessions and, and exert some control, um, you know, other than, you know, what the FAA can do. Well, that's um, important. I think just to tackle that for a second about outside jurisdictions. We've also come to realize a lot of this percentages of the bad players are, are not our heliports. It's ones coming from New Jersey and, and neighboring jurisdictions that we have absolutely, apparently, no control over. How do we tackle that? How do we work with New Jersey to say, stop allowing tourist helicopters flying with doors off, taking pictures, flying around Manhattan, cutting across the no-fly zone, and going back to New Jersey with these idiots taking pictures and saying, look what a great day I had over New York City, which completely destroys the quality of life when we're doing right by our air skies and our contracts and we allow a sister jurisdiction to just come on over is there some type of parallel legislation in other jurisdictions that we can look to is there some type of compromise we can do say hey listen we're not flying over hoboken with our doors off taking pictures of what's left in new jersey so you guys should be doing something here no disrespect to jersey but i don't see any helicopters flying over new jersey with doors off to take pictures on that um, no, I mean, absolutely. What, you know, what we've seen um, recently with, particularly from the Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer's task force on is, appears to be very constructive because it's engaging all, all the right players. So not only just the FAA, but uh, federal elected offices from New York, but also there was participants from across the New Jersey that, um, you know, uh, expressed concern as well and an interest in, in tackling this. So, um, you know, as we all know, there's certain limitations from a regulatory perspective the city has, but we believe this is best accomplished by, um, you know, convening with members from across the river and the federal electeds and the FAA to cover with the industry. And that's something that's happening. And so we support that working group um, and, you know, would like to see uh, the fruits of that labor happen. And of course, EDC would be, you know, happy to continue participating. Adam, that might be something we need to do and something we can, can do in our time together is to, is to reconvene those tri-state conversations as to, because this is something that uh, is not going to end. And the last tragedy actually was from a helicopter uh, that came into New Jersey that crashed in our waters and 
and there was a lot of concern and safety regulations that came from that and how that could happen. And it turned out, again, it's from a helicopter boat right over the border, uh, right over the Hudson River. So we will have some conversation about that. And before we end with this panel, I believe Councilmember Lander did raise his hand. So before we end with the first panel, I'd like to give Councilmember Lander a chance to ask his question. Fred, are you there? Time starts now. And we've also been joined by Councilmember Powers and Peter Koo, just so that we know. Thank you, um, uh, Chair Vallone. Yes, I, I'm, I just wanted to thank you for convening this hearing and ask to be signed on to all three of the bills as a co-sponsor. You know, we've had this hearing so many times before in various formats. Obviously, these are three new bills, but you know, I, I just what I have said of many of them, I'm just going to repeat again. You know, we have not done a good job on this issue, coming up with a way of valuing the economic benefits of the helicopter industry, which I believe are quite modest, against the human misery impact that, hel uh, that helicopters cause, which I believe are quite large. And I honestly can't remember which EDC chair it was going back, many EDC chairs, all of whom have been you know, a a good public servants and many of them friends, where I asked, like, do you have a measure of human misery? Like, is there a point at which you would conclude that the suffering of New Yorkers as a result of the noise and harm and environmental health impacts of helicopters was greater than the benefit to the city in terms of a relatively modest number of jobs and small tax revenue? And unfortunately, EDC has not conducted that uh, to my now. I mean, I guess I'll make this a question, but I, you know, I'll start with a statement. I mean, to my experience, you know, I believe it's a pretty small economic benefit and a very large human harm, more to some people than others. There are people who are kind of able to block out the noise and some people who it just dry, it's in their heads. And those people are miserable. And I don't feel we've surveyed them or come up with a measure of human misery to inform this question. We just say there's some economic benefit and we don't weigh the harm. So I, I support these three bills. You know, Chair, I appreciate you for leading on this. Um, but I guess I will just ask that as a question, like does EDC have a way of measuring the misery caused and evaluating whether or not that is worth the modest economic benefit that's gained? The new misery analysis. Some, I, you know, that we, we represent New Yorkers and their misery is, should, matters to us. And by the way, Councilor uh, Fred, we, prior, prior to you jumping on, the first thing I did was recognize the work that the, you and Margaret and Helen and so many folks did out of Manhattan uh, prior to this, because this has been a really a battle. Absolutely, no, and you've been you you've been on this a long time and picked it up. No, none of this is you know uh, this. We were all frustrated in our inability to to push action forward here. Well, at least we got three bills today that it looks like we're going to push ahead. You're here. I'm signing on. So, council, if you will me to the uh, So, EDC, if you could respond. But I, but, I, but I don't mean it facetiously. I, you know, EDC, I think, does care about the well-being of New Yorkers. It's, you know, so I guess I just am, I will genuinely ask that question. How do, how do you think about the weighing the benefits between, you know, there are modest, I agree the economic benefits are not zero. I think they're pretty modest in terms of jobs and tax revenue, but they're pretty modest. And do you have any way that you weigh that against the misery that's caused you to? You know? No, thank you. Thank you, Councilman, for the question. We appreciate that. And so first, I, I will ask if um, my colleague, Jervon, uh, could also be unmuted, just because I know she has some history here and might want to comment. Um, but I'll, I'll start by responding, you know, I mean, first, our, our contractual duty with the heliports is, you know, it's laid out in, in the mayor time contract to make sure the, the heliports are functioning and in a safe manner. Um, so, you know, that's mainly our scope and that's how I'll answer from. But I think to your broader question, is there an analysis for, um, you know, the suffering or misery, as you put it, of, of the residents? And we don't have that. And I think that's beyond the scope of EDC to do that because it does speak to a larger public health concern. And so if something was to be developed, um, we would certainly like to work with other agencies that have expertise in that type of to do that. Um, Javon, we'd like to have anything um, from your time uh, working on these issues too. Sure, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Councilman Belander. And we, um, 
we genuinely do understand the, the, the nuisance the helicopters cause. We are New Yorkers ourselves. Um, many times during my own meetings, helicopters have came across my window and I had to meet myself. Um, but we fundamentally feel that having EDC retain some control over the heliports um, is critical to just city operations. Um, if, as you would know, if we were to just stop two operations out of downtown Manhattan, that wouldn't stop the New Jersey and Westchester two operations, which would then fly over land um, at a much more at much more frequent intervals. And so we do consider what the community goes through. We are members of the community, but this is a really fine balance. Um, our ability to control a lot is limited. The things that we do control, we look to partner with the council and continuously do that to make sure that we are servicing New Yorkers in the best way possible. Um, uh, thank you for those answers. Uh, but and my my time is up. But I, I may, maybe chair, we should actually team up and like put in a, another bill that will try to like actually require the city and some partnership between EDC and DOHMH to try to measure the suffering that's caused here. Time because I, I don't believe we're currently getting the balance right. Thank you. I totally agree with you, with Ben. The, we, the Fred, we've had. The benefit analysis of this to when we deal with our constituent phone calls and what's happening in the city never comes to the level of the income that's generated. So yeah. getting to the point of regulating and controlling these new concession agreements and contracts to get to the point where we a, don't even offer them or be minimize what it is that's allowed out of the helipad. And now as we're finding out the battle we're gonna have with New Jersey, because they're just coming over our skies on regularly, and that's that's going to be something. So I think, is there any other council members that I've missed before we dismiss the first panel? Um, CJ, do you see anybody else? No, their hands are raised, Chair. Okay, good. So then I would, I, yeah, if you could continue with the next panel. Thank you to those who just testified. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Due to the large number of witnesses who have signed up to testify today, we will be limiting each panelist's speaking time to two minutes. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Rob Weisenthal to testify, followed by Joel Silverman and then Jeff Smith. Rob Weisenthal, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. I'm starts now. You have to physically unmute yourself. Can you can you do that? Is it giving me the option to unmute, or are you? I know because it starts off muted. Okay. Yeah, right. We're we're not. Your time's not. Diminishing as we figure it out. So go on. Chair Ballone, can you hear us? I can, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time, Chair Ballone and uh, fellow council members. A brief, just a brief introduction about Blade. Uh, we are a technology powered global air mobility company. Uh, our name is not Blade Helicopters for a reason uh, because we see the same transition you've been talking about to electric. Uh, zero emission helicopter, zero emission verticraft, uh, as, as you've been talking about earlier. Our goal is to provide cost effective and time uh, efficient alternatives to ground transport and congested routes. We operate, operate predominantly in the United States and in India. Additionally, the company is the leading air transporter of human organs for transplant surgery, and we service every New York City hospital. Uh, as well. We do not conduct any tours whatsoever in, the, in New York City or anywhere. Uh, you have a presentation uh, in front of you. Some of you, it is available by public record. Unfortunately, I cannot share it. In terms of the transition to electric vertical aircraft, uh, there are essentially five reasons why this is important. They're quieter, they're safer, they're greener, 
they're affordable, and they're flying already in Singapore, China, New Zealand, and we expect them to be here by 2024 uh, so we can, we can have this transition. In terms of the current New York City uh, helicopter landscape, as you've heard earlier, flights are down over 90% for charter, flights are down over 95% for tourism, uh, and the few remaining charters are flying over noise abatement routes. At the same time, as you heard, noise complaints have skyrocketed over 130%, I was told on this call. Uh, so where is the noise coming from? Uh, the noise is coming from non-New York City helicopters flying over Manhattan for tours, predominantly from New Jersey, from Fly Nyon, but now from Westchester, from Wings Air, and there are even operators coming from Florida to do tours over Manhattan. Uh, and I believe Council Member Barron said, download the flight radar app. Uh, absolutely, uh, I think all of you should to see exactly the tail numbers and who are the actors here. Uh, these helicopter operators from New Jersey are hovering in between buildings in New York City. Uh, they're preventing auto rotation safety procedures and the passengers are on board these helicopters with doors off, leaning out of aircraft to take photos. Uh, and these photos are for social media. As you probably know, posting the most thrilling uh, photos gets people lots of excitement on en and energy in uh, social media. And that's why these things have grown. Uh, just to give you an example, just last Saturday, there were 26 flights over Manhattan, over the cityscape, in between buildings, creating an echo chamber of noise by one company, Fly Nyon. We have given you the times and the tail numbers, and this is in freezing temperatures with doors off during a pandemic shutdown. Uh, you also have uh, in the testimony flight paths for, number, for a number of the, the operators who are from out of state who are uh, flying over Manhattan. It's important to note that there are absolutely no flights practically, maybe one or two coming from the EDC on the Lower West Side. They've largely been stopped and they only fly over water. As Blade only departs for their operations from waterfront heliports to uh, outside destination, following all noise avoidment routes. So how do we reduce our impact on the community? We've already uh, implemented voluntary flight restrictions for point-to-point -point flights, including noise abatement routes, voluntary uh, temporary flight restrictions, including for Shakespeare of the Park for the past five years, and we will not work with any operator who does not follow New York City rules with respect to tourism. We do not work with anyone who flies over this New York City cityscape. 80% of our flights use the quietest in class Bell 407 helicopters. What we'd like to propose in terms of the- uh, in terms Time of the, expired. In terms of, the, in terms of the legislation is that we upgrade noise barriers at heliports, we further our work towards electrification and we have potential amendments to the, le uh, to the legislation. We first need to point out there is no such thing as a stage three helicopter, period. And we can work, I'm sure Jeff Smith will tell you that as well. Thus the proposed legislation will effectively end all helicopter uh, air mobility, destroy the air mobility industry and not allow us to transition to electric. We have given some proposals of things that we can do. One thing we can do is to stop any operator who flies over a Manhattan cityscape from landing in any New York City heliport. I've spoken with all the heliport managers, they're willing to abide by this. So it's important to note that the legislation here will lead to the shutdown of New York City heliports, jeopardizing the infrastructure necessary for the imminent arrival of, aircraft, of electric aircraft. And also if we really wanna become city 2.0, not unlike Singapore, not unlike Tokyo, not unlike other cities or Mayor Garcetti in Los Angeles, it is important that we maintain this infrastructure because it will not be built again. Thanks, Rob. And I, I will reserve questions for the completion of the entire panel. So, um, so if you, who else is with uh, Blade on this panel? I believe next we have Joel Silversmith, followed by Jeff Smith. So then let me, so you know what, since it's pertinent to what we just said, let me just, Bob, if you can unmute and come back. Um, I'm, I'm not comfortable with we're not the bad guys, other people are. And uh, you know, the net result of these legislation is an end of an industry that no one that's coming on after us really cares about. And, and we're in a tough spot because the people that employ us don't want it anyway. So if a lot of this is going to come through voluntary 
concessions and steps to make the industry as safe and quiet as possible. And that's the only way to avoid the end of that industry is through that. Uh, two things we have. We have, from what your testimony of the out of jurisdiction bad guys, and then we have what is through our own helicopter industry. And how, how is Blades, I think it kind of got lost there. So Blade doesn't own the actual helicopters. You're the, the middleman that's actually contracting the routes. We arrange helicopter flights on behalf of operators, not for tours, only to depart Manhattan, uh, depart New York City, uh, and again, flying over noise abatement routes to places up to 200 miles away. So if, if I'm making that choice, it's up to you then which helicopter comes for that service. Is that correct? We can choose the operators, but again, in terms of there are no stage three helicopters and we specifically use Bell 407s because they're the quietest helicopter currently available. So it would seem to me that you would have a large say in this process. If it was mandated that the only helicopters that you would choose for this service were of the safest, greenest, most economical and environmentally friendly possible. They would either have to comply with that or they would no longer partner with and you have. And, that is, and that is our goal is to facilitate our operators and to work with them to help them for the rapid transition to electric. That is why we've had a partnership with Airbus and other manufacturers uh, for many years now to, to accelerate this adoption. Well, you have to understand that rapid transition is something that we want to be seeing. It's not, I hear numbers of 2025, I hear 2030. That's obviously not in my political lifetime and it's not something I can bring back to folks in College Point, Whitestone, Northeast Queens, and City of New York saying, hang in there, folks, we're getting there. It's just not Yeah, well, but two things. I would also say we are carbon neutral today. We fund projects in the Bronx to, uh, uh, to actually to deal with uh, uh, methane collection. So with what we have today, we are carbon neutral. And also remember, these aircraft are flying today. Some of the earliest certification dates that have been proposed are as early as 2022. We're being conservative by saying 2024, 2025. Well, you're also saying that we use noise abatement routes and we take efforts. Those are things that happened because this committee came in with everyone that's on this that's watching. And thank you. I see Marie. I see a bunch of people out there that uh, have taken the time to be at today's hearing because we drew a line a few years ago saying we can't just say it's not our responsibility. It's the FAA. We have to take these steps. And one of those steps were the helicopters are flying directly over the same damn route time and time again until we complained like, oh, we can mitigate that, we can go a little bit this way, we can go a little bit that way, we can find the, the least impactful way over residential or, or, or folks that actually are underneath these flight paths. And that was the first step to seeing some relief. But that only happened through voluntary concession. So I just say it is so important that that dialogue, now you, you gave some right at the end of the testimony, you gave some ideas like soundproofing. What were some of the other ideas that while we're dealing with today that we can take immediate steps to get some relief from the orders. Well, I think one of the, um, obviously the, the, the first and most important thing is, you know, this prohibition in stage three helicopters, which currently do not exist, according to the FAA, that shuts everything down. So I think we can think about some type of timeline uh, to once electric is available to being able to switch and for us to help our these all the operators as one community to do so that. So all stage two helicopters are the same? Uh, certain have lower decibel levels, uh, but uh, you know they vary. They vary in size and they vary in uh, in noise. I can't give you on this testimony right now the facts as I don't have them in front of uh, in front of us. But there are no stage three helicopters. Well, remember the, for my non helicopter aviation skills is I'm sure not all stage two helicopters are created equally, and I'm that, sure that that's correct to stage three the mandate of using the most recent 2021 brand new, just like when I go to get a car, I want to get every option on it, that every helicopter that's going to be used through Blade or any of the city is going to make sure that they have A, B, C, D, and E, that it has the top five possible until we get to stage three. But we haven't, we, those drafting the legislation and passing to protect New York, have been given any of that to say, well, these are some helicopters that are amazingly green and quiet that we can use until we get well, I, what I can, as I said in, in our, my testimony, 80% of the 80% uh, of the helicopter flights that we arrange are in Bell 407 helicopters, 
which by certain jurisdiction have been de deemed not noisy helicopters. They are clearly quieter than others, but again, there are a variety of different helicopters out there. We do our best to use uh, the quietest helicopters that we can use. Uh, the second point, uh, uh, Chair Vallone, uh, in terms of the potential uh, uh, amendments to the legislation is that we believe uh, through our council that we can prohibit landings at New York City heliports by operators that violate EDC mandated city tourism routes and noise abatement routes or operate in an unsafe manner. Uh, and that's something that-, do that from a, what, what tool, we would definitely agree with something like that. <laughs> If, if you, we have the ability to stop the landing or not allow the route in the first place because they're not complying, we want to make sure that we all have many of these Many of these companies uh, from Westchester, New Jersey, and even elsewhere still at times used for charter business our local heliports in Manhattan. While we cannot prevent someone from taking off, uh, from busing people from Manhattan to New Jersey to then fly over into disrupt neighborhoods in Manhattan, flying in between the cityscape we can prevent them from landing in New York City heliports. Uh, and that is something I've spoken to each of the managers of the uh, heliports uh, in New York City, and they seem interested and willing to discuss it. Uh, and maybe that, that might be something we immediately have to maybe discuss an amendment to this. So preventing anyone from landing on one of our helipads and having one of these joy rides over our city that came from another jurisdiction. Yes, correct. Something to me that I'd like to have in place by tomorrow, basically. Correct, sir. The third, the third, uh, I, the third potential amendment is an industry-funded watch group, dog group. We're willing to take a leadership position at that. If so, the council would like that to track paths to ensure compliance with noise abatement routes and altitudes, and that operators that violate these routes would lose their landing privileges at New York City heliports, and Blade would no longer work with them. Uh, and I think that's important because you know you've seen the technology like Flight Radar 24. Uh, that the councilman, uh, a council member uh, uh, raised. This is very important. It gives you the time, the altitudes, and the tail numbers, and you can see who- Rob, um, I think you and I can probably have a very good conversation for a long time, and, but in a lot of respect to the people that are waiting. I thank you. Understood. For, but I do thank you for those, because those are important, and those are real changes that can be made immediately. And that's something that we, it's our responsibility to get to the folks in the city of New York to say that these are the changes that are happening as a result of these bills, our camaraderie, the legislation, the committee hearings, the joint participation. And that is so important. So, thank you for that. so um, let's continue on with our, our next topic. Thank you. thank you, Chair. I'd now like to welcome Joel Silversmith to testify, followed by Jeff Smith and then Tom McCormick. Joel Silversmith, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. And again, if any council members want to jump in during these three panels, just please let me know. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joel Silversmith. I'm an attorney with the firm of KMA Zuckert, which specializes in aviation law. And I'm speaking a little bit out of order since uh, Jeff Smith will be speaking to the helicopter industry more directly and how it attempts to work with the city to address issues of concern. But the ERCHC has asked me to speak briefly on some of the legal issues. Uh, as background, and as I imagine many of the members of the committee know, aviation is a federally regulated industry and Congress, the courts and the FAA have very deliberately left little room for local regulation. And although I'm not going to specifically address Mr. Weisenthal's remarks, I do have to disagree with him. Um, I do not believe there is an opportunity for the Manhattan heliports current operators to make their own decisions about who can and can't operate there. I'd like to just briefly mention the three basic principles that are of concern. Uh, the first is the Airport Noise and Capacity Act of 1990, which was briefly referenced by the EDC director. Uh, this was adopted by Congress very deliberately to prevent local noise and access restrictions from being adopted. It does provide a very narrow path for the adoption of local restrictions, but the current bills do not follow the requirements of that statute. So we believe that ANCA prohibits the restrictions in the two proposed bills, 2026 and 2067. Uh, secondly, there's a long-standing prohibition on what Congress calls exclusive rights at airports that have ever received federal aid. And in New York, this includes at least two of the three heliports. Um, essentially, exclusive rights has been interpreted to mean that one group of operators cannot be favored over the expense of another. We believe the two proposed bills also have a problem because of the exclusive rights prohibition. The third issue is preemption. Uh, there are two types of preemption. I won't get into the legal technical details, but essentially preemption is intended to generally ensure 
that only the federal government sets rules for the operation of aircraft, not municipalities. We don't believe the two proposed bills meet either. Time expired. I would obviously be certain happy to take any questions about this and, of course, engage further. We assume we'll be having continuing conversations with the committee after today. Joel, since I, I clearly see from one lawyer to another, I would be happy to talk to you about the FAA limitations and what we can do. And if I had to sit back and wait for the FAA to help the folks in New York City, nothing would ever be friggin' done around you. So what we have done is voluntarily get these things done with the threat of different fines, stopping of contracts and regulation. And if that's the only way we can get relief in New York City, we will continue to do that. Okay. Next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Jeff Smith to testify, followed by Tom McCormick and then Emma Chandler. Jeff Smith, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Vallone and the, uh, the other committee members and everybody uh, that participated today. Uh, out of the 36 uh, New York City committees, I believe the Economic um, Development Committee is the right place to have this discussion because as we talk about um, uh, lower noise levels, zero emissions, more affordability for more New Yorkers to travel by air. Uh, this bill uh, with the stage three completely eliminates that dream. Uh, the three heliports will not be able to sustain themselves past, uh, past this legislation. Uh, there is one uh, helicopter that's actually stage, considered stage three. Uh, it's a very expensive helicopter. It's, um, it's not meant for, um, this, for smaller amounts of people. It's a, it's a heavier carrier. Um, the, uh, currently, as you've already heard, the helicopter industry is what has been wiped out over the last year from due to the pandemic and other reasons, up to 90%. What we are seeing now is uh, because of the migrating out of uh, Manhattan, that there is much more of a commuting traffic that's uh, people are coming from their secondary homes coming into uh, Manhattan to work and then traveling back, even making more important for the heliport infrastructure. The one thing that we have heard in, um, throughout the beginning of this testimony is noise and overflights of New York City. Uh, the current legislation will have zero effect on that. We will shut down the three heliports and the noise will continue. Uh, I have been in this process for over 15 years. I've been through the 2010 Air Tour SOP that was uh, developed by the EDC and the ERHC with the five commercial operators. I've seen uh, the 2016 um, uh, decision of about the 50% reduction of air Time tours. Mixed by it. All of those things were always prefaced by supply and demand. If you make these kind of decisions, that demand will find the supply, uh, that supply will find the demand somewhere else. And that's exactly what has happened with New York City losing control of the air tour and the commercial air tour business and one route they fly is because they found some other place to do it without, without that control. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I do acknowledge the problem of outside jurisdiction. So uh, we have to be very cognizant. It's one thing to close our borders, it doesn't stop the problem. So we're going to have to work with our state and federal brothers and sisters to figure this out. Too. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'd now like to welcome Tom McCormick to testify, followed by Emma Chandler and then Arlene Bronzoft. Tom McCormick, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Vallone and uh, other committee members. <clears throat> I wanna thank you for inviting the Eastern Region Helicopter Council to speak with you all today. Uh, we've enjoyed a wonderful relationship with the city council that goes back to 1977. And the council's enjoyed a relationship with the helicopter industry since its very beginning. I, I don't know if many of you know, but I'm sure some of you know, the first military helicopter training center in the US during World War II was at Floyd Bennett Field for the Navy Coast Guard, Army Air Corps, and uh, British Royal, or, uh, Royal Air Force. That same location where NYPD operates from today is where they developed the first rescue hoist, which allowed the very first life-saving mission with a helicopter from Battery Park off the shore of New Jersey to uh, go to the assistance of a US Naval warship. Since that time, you've had West 30th open in 1956, the downtown heliport 
opened in 1960 and the east side opened in 1972. As was pointed out earlier today, the downtown heliport is the only heliport in New York City and quite possibly the country that can support the presidential helicopter flight uh, detail that includes the uh, V-22 Osprey. Uh, the east side, which uh, Rob Wiesenthal mentioned, is a key player that opened in 1972. And that, that's a key player in the Oregon transport process that supports the uh, various local hospitals. Uh, so just to, to further the conversation that began earlier, these recommendations won't stop the noise. They will end the economic viability of the heliports. And the, I would argue that the economic viability of the heliports extends well beyond the point of sale and the jobs it creates at the local level at, at the point of uh, embarkation and departure. It impacts the entire in, or economy of- Time expires. And just to, to follow up on the DCAS fleet, none of those aircraft were certified under the stage three requirements. None of the aircraft that the city operates today meet the stage three requirements either. And that's uh, all I have to share with it, but I'm happy to answer as many questions on the topic as you like. I'm pretty well versed in it. Um, we are amending the bills as we speak to include the TCAS fleet, so they'll be figuring out tomorrow morning on how to comply with all of this. Uh, I also do want to say, yes, we've had our struggles together in the past, but a lot of the things that have been achieved in, through you voluntarily working with the pilots to either fly higher, to fly different routes, and a lot of that can only be done. So we have to continue that dialogue because if we sit back and say it's FAA or it's, it's the LaGuardia Airport space or it's the JFK Airport space, um, then we're left with nothing else to do but legislation because there's no one working with us. So un unless we continue that, these are the bills that result of non-working out these situations. Otherwise, we have no other choice. Now, I think we have about a dozen folks left to go. So we're going to uh, keep that time and then keep everyone going. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Emma Chandler to testify, followed by Arlene Bronzoft and then Eric Katzman. Emma Chandler, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in favor of the proposed legislation. My name is Emma Chandler. I represent the Friends of Governors Island. We are an independent nonprofit that works to ensure the island's continued growth and accessibility is a vibrant resource. Um, the Friends has long advocated for a full ban on all non-essential helicopter flights from city-owned heliports. In 2015 and 2016, working with community members and elected officials, we organized public rallies in support of council proposed legislation to ban tourist helicopter flights, of which there were 59,000 in 2015 alone. While this bill is ultimately shelved in favor of a concession agreement that we did not support, we continue to view any legislation that works to curb non-essential helicopter traffic as a step in the right direction. The noise from helicopter traffic is a huge issue on Governor's Island. At any given moment between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., you'll find several helicopters taking off, landing, hovering in the airspace adjacent to the island. And now with the increase in local tourist flights from both New Jersey and Westchester, which do not abide by the city's prohibition of flights over Governor's Island, many of them can be observed hovering directly above us for minutes at a time. The unending din of helicopter traffic is the most frequent complaint that we receive from our visitors. It not only destroys peaceful enjoyment of our outdoor spaces, but it also makes it impossible to hear tour guides, programmers, performers, and the like, um, or even carry on a conversation with the person next to you. And it's not just Governor's Island, um, but parks across our entire city, as evidenced by the massive increase in helicopter noise complaints reported by 311 this year. In the past decade, the city has spent easily a billion dollars improving its waterfront resources and building an incredible green necklace of spectacular open spaces. During the COVID-19 pandemic, these parks and open spaces have been more critical than ever as a public health resource to provide both physical and mental health benefits. It's a waste of public resources to destroy the public experience of these parks Time expired. sensory assault of non-essential helicopters. We urge the council to put its full support behind federal legislation and would prohibit all non-essential flights over densely populated areas by endorsing the Safe and Quiet Skies Act proposed by Representatives Nadler, Maloney, and Velasquez. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. 
Thank you. Next, I will welcome Arlene Bronzov to testify, followed by Eric Katzman and then Laura Bernbeck. Arlene Bronzov, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you to the chair and members of the committee. I've listened to people speak and they've talked about diminished quality of life for those people exposed to noise. For over 40 years, I've done research and written on the adverse effects of noise to health. So I would like to underscore the fact that the literature is full with studies that link noise to health impacts. And so I rather not speak to quality of life. I would not say people are miserable. What we are noticing is that people say they're miserable and unhappy. And I've read newspaper articles written during the pandemic addressing that. Let me stress that noise is harmful to health. And as far as cost, I've heard people talking about the cost will be impacted if we cannot have people who uh, own helicopters and rent helicopters. That is critical. Well, let me tell you what one of the major costs in the United States is, and that's to health. And the studies in the United States and abroad have shown that if we continue to expose people to noise, the cost of medical bills will be high. So let me stress, when you talk about industry and how cost is important to them, I'm gonna tell you all people living in the United States will have to pay the cost for health of the people who are admitted to hospitals because of noise. And as far as diminished quality of life, yes, that's true. But that is just a phrase. What I want you to hear is that noise pollution is harmful to health. Thank you. Time expired. Thank you, Arlene, and thank you for always contacting our office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Eric Katzman to testify, followed by Laura Burnback and then Jeffrey Starin. Eric Katzman, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. Committee Chair Vallone and other distinguished committee members. My name is Eric Katzman. It is my pleasure as a board member of Stop the Chop in New York, New Jersey, to join you today to discuss the important bills. For those of you not familiar, Stop the Chop is a nonprofit grassroots organization formed in 2014 to advocate for and educate everyday citizens of all five boroughs and the surrounding area whose quality of life and safety is severely and negatively impacted by the non-essential non -essential helicopter industry. The fight to sanely regulate this industry goes back many decades, yet conditions have not gotten better. In 2016, the helicopter industry agreed to limit the number of flights. Indeed, the industry did not live up to the spirit of the agreement, and thus it is questionable they will do so in the future. As I assume you are aware, our federal uh, congressional delegation has introduced legislation to ban all non-essential helicopter flights over New York City. Stop the Chop supports uh, HR 4880, which was originally introduced in late 2019. The, the issues surrounding the non-essential helicopter industry are fairly complex, and I don't have time to talk to all of them today. The current uh, bills are a step in the right, right direction and, and Stop the Chop supports all of them, but we don't believe they go far enough. In terms of economics, Stop the Chop believes the only argument the industry can make to sustain their profit-making industry is a, is a weak one. And in several prior hearings before the council, the industry's claims were debunked. Stop the Chop believes the negative economic externalities of non-essential helicopters overwhelms whatever modest claims the industry suggests it delivers to New York City. These economic externalities, which we believe the EDC needs to consider and incorporate, include environmental and health costs, along with safety. Stop the Chop asks this committee to pass the legislation to terminate Time the helicopter expired. leases on New York City-owned land and work with the board of the Hudson River Park Trust to do the same thing for the West 30th Street heliport. If it is not possible, then as Stop the Chop would like to see a dramatic reduction in the number of flights allowed from these helicopters. And again, 
Lastly, Stop the Chop would like all New York City political leaders to publicly support H.R. 4880. Thank you for your time. Eric, I just want to also thank you. When there was no data, there was just your data. When there was no way to track anyone, there was your tracking. And when there was no sage advice or counsel on how to go forward, you guys were there. So I always wanted to thank you for, for continually bringing us to where we are today. A lot of these pieces of legislation come from the hard work that you guys have done. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Laura Bernbach, followed by Jeffrey Sterin, and then Lo Vandervock. Laura Bernbach, you may begin upon this urgent announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Sorry, I was not able to unmute myself for a moment there. Sorry, my life was. <laughs> a, a problem we're all too familiar with these days. Um, so good morning, council members and fellow members of the public. My name is Laura Bernbach. I'm the executive director of the Brooklyn Heights Association, as well as a board member of Stop the Chop New York, New Jersey. I want to thank the council for its attention and sincere commitment to the problem of regulating helicopter noise, pollution, and safety in our city as evidenced through these bills under discussion today. And I want to especially thank you, Chairman Vallone, for not passing the buck and throwing up your hands and saying, there's nothing we can do. This is only about the FAA and this is only about New Jersey. So thank you so much for focusing on what we here in New York City can do. Although the BHA supports uh, the bills today, intro 2026, 27, and intro 2067, we do strongly believe that these bills do not go far enough to protect the millions of New Yorkers uh, and those in the metropolitan area overall suffering from the noise and environmental pollution created by tourist and commuter flights. It's been widely reported this year about the 311 data, so I don't need to go over that again. We've all heard that multiple times. Brooklyn's waterfront communities have been plagued by years for years by these noisy and completely unnecessary intrusions into our public spaces, our homes, and our peace of mind. We are grateful that the city has invested in developing the waterfront to add much needed outdoor space for rest and recreation as evidenced like never before during this pandemic. But we are baffled that for-profit entities continue to be allowed to pollute our air and harass visitors and residents alike on a daily basis. The city truly should be focused on combating climate change, not continuing to support an industry that caters to the few citizens who have a couple hundred extra dollars to burn on a quick trip to the airport or to the- Time expired. On behalf of the BHA and Stop the Chop, we thank you for these preliminary steps. Like Eric before me, I ask you and all other local elected officials to support the House Bill 4880, sponsored by our congressional delegation, uh, Carolyn Maloney, Gerald Nadler, and Nydia Velasquez, among others. Thank you very much for this hearing today and all the work you're doing to regulate this industry. Thank you, Larry. And just so you know, we're also going to be reaching out to our New York State Assembly and State Senator partners for sister legislation. So when counties like uh, Westchester and anyone else in New York, they should not have the right to interfere on New York City as sister location just because they're flying someone from a different county in New York State. So we're going to try to not just make it federal, but also state also. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Jeffrey Sterin, followed by Lo Vandervock, and then Ajit Thomas. Jeffrey Sterin, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Can you hear me? Hello, and thank you. Yeah. My name is Jeffrey Starr and I am the president of nextgennoise.org. We are a Brooklyn-based organization that works to implement common sense solutions to aviation noise. When I read the proposed legislation and upon listening just now to the testimony, I immediately recognized a kind of what I would call an industry lobbying maneuver. That's a technique that is used by attorneys and their lobbying franchise and politicians to delay or otherwise obfuscate the real issues at hand. Of course, stage three is needed to be implemented. That is just common sense. 
but by drawing our attention only to stage three technicalities and electric helicopters that are at least 20 years away only serves to divert our focus away from common sense solutions, which I will present shortly. And intentionally, in my view, bog us down in technicalities when in fact, this council has the power to pass larger and bolder and farther reaching legislation than is asked of it with these bills. Let me bring home a transportation analogy that everyone can understand. Every city in the United States has regulations forbidding the conveyance, for example, of 18 wheeler tractor trailers repeatedly traveling down residential streets. These regulations apply to all manner of noisy, intrusive, including vehicles. They are in place for a reason, for safety foremost, but also to keep property values stable and neighborhoods comfortable and enjoyable and fun places to reside. In other words, you just can't drive a tractor trailer down residential streets simply because it is the shortest distance between one warehouse to another. And by the way, the regulations apply to sightseeing buses as well. The highways in the sky above us, which are hard coded into the airspace by the FAA, are nothing more than about 10 fixed helicopter routes that helicopters must traverse and never deviate from when traveling through New York City airspace. These routes even have names, just like city streets. So here's the solution. Time expired. Require these flying vehicles to travel over the water that surrounds New York City. I would like to ask if, it's, if it is really this body's responsibility to place industry profits over safety, over the investments we've made in our homes. Why does New York City prefer to give helicopters a free pass, which because of that will ultimately drive down property values, which then impact city revenue. And the spiral just continues downward from there. Talk about a fast race to the bottom. Well, that's what we are looking at here. Don't dismiss that, please. Of course, the helicopter lobbyists are going to bemoan such a bold regulation. But remember this, it is only because it will eat into their bottom line. There is no other reason. Of course, the first words out of an industry lobbyist mouth would be, but we don't control the airspace. That's the FAA's domain. And they would be correct. But are these helicopters taking off and landing onto and from city-owned property? Yes, they are. I believe they are. And can the city levy a hefty tax among other alternatives on those companies that ignore regulation requirely, requiring them to travel offshore? I think the city can. Does this city, this administration, this legislative body have the willpower and more importantly, the strength of character to do what is right by the New York City people? So with all the foregoing in mind, I'd like to ask the city council a simple question. Why is this legislative body giving the helicopter industry a free pass? The answer to that question also provides the answer to the solution. Thank you for your consideration. Jeff, I hope you were listening to the whole hearing prior to those comments, and I'm sure you'll have questions and answers very different to what we've just given. We are united in opposition, and actually you brought up the commercial truck traffic. It's the other batch of legislation I'm very happy to have passed. It's the same annoying industry that refuses to abide by our residential streets. So uh, we are united in our opposition. So. Jason, how many more? I just want to make sure that the folks are waiting know where, where they are in the line for how many folks are still left to testify. One, two, three. Okay, so let's get let's ten. Get ten. Okay, so anyone who's left to go, so everyone, you got two minutes. Uh, if you can't finish, just like with the last uh, gentleman, then you can submit because we pass around the email post hearing all of the exhibits and testimony that was submitted, so you can take your time and go through them. Uh, to make sure you send that to committee council and they'll pass that around. So for the next 10 people, no, it's not too much longer for the next 10. Thank you, Chair. I'd now I'd like to welcome Lo Vandervoch to testify, followed by Ajit Thomas and then Albert Marashi. Lo Vandervoch, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Yes, I got it. I got it. Perfect. Can you hear me? We got you. Yep. Okay, thank you. My name is Lo Vanderbalk. I'm president of Carnegie Hill Neighbors, our catchment. It's a, we are a quality of life and preservation organization. Uh, our catchment area, we've been in existence for 50 years. Our catchment area borders Central Park from 86 to 98th Street, and we have suffered uh, a lot of helicopter noise, and it has been increasing over the last four years. Uh, we applaud. We applaud these three bills, and 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 we applaud 
uh, uh, Chair Valone's uh, committee for taking this on. We think we think you are pushing you are pushing at least what can be done at the city level. Uh, maybe some people say you can do more, but at least these are very good first steps. Um, also, we recognize, of course, that that the problem is far greater than can currently be tackled at the city level. And uh, we therefore want to say that uh, we urge everyone to, to support HR 4880, the, the bill that is sponsored by um, uh, Carol Maloney and Nadler and Val Valquez. And we think that that, is, that would be a major step. And we think a lot of energy should be put into seeing that that bill gets passed. Uh, thank you very much for, um, for hearing us out. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Ajit Thomas to testify, followed by Albert Marashi and then David Murphy. Ajit Thomas, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, it pained me greatly to see a committee focus on economy of chartered helicopters while totally ignoring the well-established body of scientific work on the harmful effects of aviation noise. Without regurgitating scientific publications entirely, aviation noise is proven to negatively impact adult and child cognition, increase heart ail ailments, and cause psychological imbalance. These facts were a large factor in developing quieter aircraft, I'm talking about fixed wing aircraft engines, and to limit aircraft approaches near airports. I've recorded helicopters flying over Central Park, generating in excess of 95 decibels. To help frame this, large trucks driving on Columbus Avenue near me generate about 65 to 70 decibels, and ambulances with the sirens on are at about 85 decibels. So while these road vehicles hit peak decibels only for a fleeting second, a single helicopter's noise lingers at peak decibels for several minutes. So you compound one flight with hundreds of them in New York, and one will soon go mad before one dies of a heart attack. So this committee, uh, as the EDC chair mentioned earlier, you know, might choose to ignore the health ailments caused by aviation noise in adults and children, because accretion of health ailments and the tabulation of health costs is too difficult to model for an ec econometric model. I, I see that, but the city has to figure out a way to kind of consider that as it looks at revenue, uh, net revenues. Now, the city offers very few places of refuge for its poor and middle-class uh, residents, and these helicopters are, copters are destroying the little solace that we found here. And you know, helicopters users who willingly decamp to the idyllic refuges in the Hamptons or other places should not get to destroy our health. Time but... expired. So we think that the city should reject any incremental revenue that helicopters bring to the city, uh, especially for those who chose to stay back. We deserve a, like a safer and a healthier city. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd now like to welcome Albert Marashi to testify, followed by David Murphy and then Marie Tamel. Albert Marashi, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Vallone, for hosting this. Um, I mean, I have um, attended many meetings about this, and it's the same rhetoric. So I sort of have lost hope, um, Don't lose hope that we were we will relieve. I mean, we were. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear it. Okay. I no yeah, I, I'm going to make it very short because I get very frustrated hearing this. I mean, as I said, I've been, I have attended many, many, many meetings before about this. I live in Whitestone and I have not seen uh, much of a relief except when uh, Congressman Swazi uh, um, uh, redirected these flights, leaving uh Hamptons flying into the city and that was very little relief even under pandemic they still fly over my house and it affects my work from home and uh, I think the only option here to be successful is to support the legislation that bans these non-essential helicopters uh, altogether thank you 
Thank you, Albert. And yes, Whitestone was the main reason Congressman Swazi and I fought to change those routes. So keep the faith. It's changing. Thank you. Next, we will hear from David Murphy, followed by Marie Tamel, and then Melanie Bright. David Murphy, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? We have you, David. Uh, thank you, Chair Vallone and committee members. My name is David Murphy. I live on Central Park West, and I'm a member of Stop the Chop. I want to underscore what others have said about the tourist helicopter companies operating out of New Jersey. Our neighborhood, the West 80s and 90s, is beset by tourist helicopters. It's much worse than it was in 2016. As you know, they take off from Linden or Kearney, evading the agreement between the EDC and the companies that operate out of New York. The biggest tourist operator being Fly Nyon, as I think you know, especially on Sundays. <laughs> um, they fly up the Hudson, head across Manhattan in the West 80s or low 90s, then circle <laughs> over Central Park, the reservoir for up to two minutes. They fly low enough that I can see the Fly Nyon logo on the copter many times. They're whap, whap, whapping echoes off the adjacent, adjacent buildings and it gets louder as the copters make their turns to uh, fly over the reservoir. Then they drift down the east side. On their way back, they circle over Madison Square. I've seen them there. They fly over Brooklyn or Governor's Island, as we've heard. Although COVID has somewhat reduced their frequency in peak periods, Tourist helicopters can come over the same block seven or eight times in an hour because they all fly the same route. So imagine helicopters going over your house, maybe one every eight minutes, and you hear the noise uh, for a good part of that eight minutes before the next one comes. We've had some cases where a helicopter crashes. Imagine a crash on a school. Mixed by it. Or, um, so I underscore the efforts made to stop this um, extraction of wealth from New Jersey. Thank you. David, we hear you. And it's even worse than that. From Friday to Sunday, it's every two minutes over the communities in Northeast Queens. So we are all united uh, in this battle of quality of life and just constant attack on our senses. So thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Marie Tamel followed by Melody Bryant and then Stephen Fox. Marie Tamal, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Stephen Fox, okay. Thank Time you. starts now. Thank you, Chairman Vallone and all attendees. I'm one of those people that lives on West 88th Street. I've been using Flight Planner app for years. I've got 40 to 50 flights coming down my block a day to go over the reservoir. Then you have people from Boston, Philly, the Hamptons, they all want to go over the money shot of the reservoir. The best thing that ever happened to me was the COVID-19, the COVID shutdown. As sad as it was, I had three months of no helicopters. My nervous system returned to normal. I had peace of mind. I could meditate again. It's obscene and undemocratic that a few people their needs outweigh the needs of millions of other people. This is not a democracy. If Blade adds helicopters to those flights, I'm gonna to have to leave the city. The, the, the council should be very concerned about the flight due to quality of life issues out of this town because the helicopters are significant. I have been running the flight planner app I have hundreds, if not thousands of screenshots of pilots misbehaving. You need to do more to study these people and not by the helicopter industry. There are helicopters, I have photos of them in the sky. They're not on the app because more and more they're turning the transponders off so they can't be watched by the app. More and more, I have evidence of this. I have evidence of Sigorskis driving over my apartment at 165 miles an hour and 800 feet. 
helicopters playing chicken with each other over the reservoir, playing chicken with private planes that are meandering up there. These pilots are doing whatever they want, and it is unsafe. It's a matter of time before the major time disaster expired. happens. Thank you. Marie, thank you for that. You know, it's those personal testimonies that have resulted to how we got here today. Because some, we felt so lost in having any control or any say in this industry. I, I didn't even have phone calls that were picked up for years. I didn't care. So now the phones are picking up. So it, it, it takes that, unfortunately, level of frustration and anger to be heard uh, over these communities that have to suffer the most. Uh, and it just hasn't been there. So thank you. Next, we'll hear from Melody Bryant, followed by Stephen Fox, and then Charles Komanoff. Melody Bryant, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. My name is Melody Bryant, and thank you for taking my testimony today. I'll be brief. Helicopters are a real problem for New Yorkers, and not just the helicopters that use city heliports. This last weekend, which was cold and blustery, 166 sorties flew over Manhattan from New Jersey. At this rate, summer is shaping up to be a real nightmare here. And with Blade going public and announcing their stated growth plans, it's not going to get any better. So anything we can do is good, but I don't understand why we're still tiptoeing around the real solution. Correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, two of the heliports hosting these helicopters are on city land. Why can't the city council terminate these leases now? Pre-COVID, there were 50,000 flights from city heliports annually. That's 100,000 takeoffs and landings. Why, aren't we talk why are we talking about noise levels and asking for a study about electric helicopters, which won't be in use for another decade? And who says they'll be any quieter? And why are we catering to wealthy commuters and charter companies at the expense of the health and safety of literally millions of New Yorkers who cannot enjoy their public space along the shoreline, frankly, it stinks, and who live under their flight paths? Time is passing and New Yorkers are suffering. Please, I'm begging the New York City Council to do better. If we have no power to stop the ensuing flood of tourist helicopters from New Jersey, at least we can reduce the pain at home. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. Next, we will hear from Stephen Fox, followed by Charles Komanoff, and then Larry Goldhirsch. Stephen Fox, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Great. Um, my name is Stephen Fox. Thank you so much for the opportunity to give this testimony. This is my first time ever attending a city council hearing. Um, I'm the director of a performing arts organization in New York City. I was born and raised in New York City and have lived here most of my life. Uh, I love this city and there's never been anything that has ever made me think about leaving the city. That is until the helicopter problem got out of hand. Then for the first time, my wife and I started making plans to move out of the city. As the New York Times rightly pointed out in 2016, a plague of helicopters is ruining New York. Where my wife and I live on Riverside Drive in Manhattan, helicopters were going up and down the Hudson River all day, every day, perhaps a little bit less on Sundays or when it was raining, we started to pray for rain some days. It was a constant all day source of noise and disturbance, worse than any quality of life issue we've ever experienced in New York. Apparently there was an agreement in 2016 between the city and downtown Manhattan heliport, but it made no difference. It does not make a difference to have one helicopter every two minutes rather than one helicopter every one minute. Living underneath constant helicopter noise is like living in a war zone. I'm not one for overregulation, but if there were ever an argument for regulation, it's here. You have a group of three to four tourists, almost all of whom are not tax paying New York City residents, disturbing many, many thousands of tax paying New York City residents with one helicopter joyride. It's the same for commuter helicopters. Just a few people can disturb thousands so they can just get to the airport a little faster or get to the Hamptons a little bit faster. There's no room for non-essential helicopters over a densely populated city such as New York. Where I'm usually someone who believes in compromise, this is not an area for compromise. Making helicopters slightly softer or slightly less regular- Time expired. In the problem. Greed cannot win this battle. If it does, New York will lose so many of its residents and tax revenue in order to keep a relatively small industry with a big lobbyist. This is a clear cut issue. Tourist and commuter helicopters need to be banned. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Charles Komanoff to testify, followed okay. by Larry. Followed by Larry Goldhirsch. Charles Komanoff, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, hi, hello, uh, Chair Vallone, um, other members of the council, if you're still here. I think you saved uh, the best for last, or at least the most recent, uh, Stephen Fox and Melody Bryant um, stole my fire. Uh, I'm glad that you guys did. And some of the rest of my fire, you can see in the uh, post that was placed on Streets blog um, early yesterday evening um, by me called uh, Don't Regulate New York City Helicopter Flights, Ban Them. Um, and that's really what we should be moving toward. Um, and I uh, couldn't agree more with both Stephen and Melody um, that there is no meaningful distinction between uh, commuter helicopters and tourist helicopters. They're both serving a tiny, rarefied, privileged, uh, entitled slice of the population at the expense of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of us who have to suffer the noise. Um, my, uh, specific, my specific suggestion, uh, Mr. Chair, um, is that we follow your uh, recommendation and that of your fellow uh, committee member, uh, Brad Lander, um, and that you um, direct uh, the um, uh, Economic Development uh, uh, Commission and the Department of Health and Mental Health to commission a study of the noise annoyance costs of helicopters over the city of New York. I have some experience in that field myself. Uh, in the year 2000, I uh, published or produced a study for the Noise Pollution Clearinghouse on the noise costs of jet skis, you know, personal watercraft uh, in America called drowning in noise. It's not uh, really rocket science. There are established means of translating uh, increases over ambient noise level Time expired. Uh, into reduced property values, human suffering, and as Dr. Bronzaft uh, described, losses of human health. Uh, I'm available to do that work. Other uh, applied economists are as well. We need to have a counterweight to the supposed economic benefits of helicopter flights so that we can demonstrate that continued helicopter flights in to and over New York City do not pass any plausible cost benefit test. Thank you. Thank you, Charles and Melody and Steve and everyone. And I, I, just to kind of rehash the, the first victories back in 2016 were only over the tourism industry and they didn't deal with day-to-day -day charter um, flights that were happening and, and they were arch actually probably even a bigger plague for communities like yours and mine so it wasn't until these subsequent hearings and bills that we tied in both the tourism and the charter industries to these same constraints. And, and now you have conversations like today where you're seeing for the first time things being volunteered and offered to make our lives uh, a little bit more sane. And the, the COVID world that we are all now unfortunately living in does amplify the noise that we sometimes almost didn't even hear or took for granted before. So we can hear things now for miles that we didn't even hear before. So now when you have a helicopter flight coming over, it is a hundred times worse than it even was in the, the noise filled skies that we had before. So um, even that needs to be dealt with. And, and I thank you for staying Charles and, and the three of you toured uh, coming up on two and a half hours of this hearing to give us your testimony. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Larry Goldhirsch, followed by Robert Ackerman. Larry Goldhirsch, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, I'm a personal injury lawyer in a large Manhattan firm. On May 21st, 2004, a wind blast from a helicopter at the 30th Street heliport blew a cyclist off his bike, injuring him. He was finally able to settle the case five years later. On March 27, 2007, a man was bicycling past the 30th Street heliport, which you may know is owned and operated by Air Pegasus, when he was blown into another cyclist by a gust of wind from a landing helicopter. He sued Air Pegasus 
and was able to settle his case some years later. Most recently, a client of mine, a 90-year-old lady in very good shape, was blown off her, helicopter, her bicycle on November 25th, 2018, by the downdraft of a helicopter at the heliport. She suffered several fractured ribs, a punctured lung, and was hospitalized for over a week. After she was thrown, she tried to report the incident to Air Pegasus personnel on the tarmac, but she reported to me he fled into a building and locked the door on her. She was unable to report it. I filed suit on her behalf in 2020. Air Pegasus replied that they kept no records of which helicopters were involved in this accident, and they sued nine other helicopter companies that were using the premises all that afternoon. The case is still ongoing. Air Pegasus refuses to take any responsibility for such accidents. If you were to award more business for this entity by increasing routes, I urge you to include some agreement whereby all heliports will be responsible for any injuries caused by any helicopters using their facility. By having a heliport so close to pedestrian and bicycle paths, Pegasus should be held strictly liable to any injured persons on the ground without it being necessary for such time expired. Obtain a lawyer to sue for injuries, which usually takes years to resolve, similar to the standards that we have now on international flights, which pay passengers for any accident that occur. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Ackerman. We've also been joined by Councilmember Cornegy. Rob, I see you there. Thanks for making that note. If you have any questions or want to jump in, just let me know. Yes, this is this is Bob Ackerman. Can you hear me and see me? We got you, Bob. I see you. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Actually, I was very busy and I just got on and and you called me, so I just made it in time. Thank Sometimes you. Sometimes it works there. out. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a 52 year resident of Park Slope. I raised a family there. I still have my home there. And, um, you know, there's so much noise pollution in the city and everything has gotten so much more crowded in all these years. Um, and uh, the helicopters uh, give us a terrible experience adding to that pollution with all the annoyance and loud sound and vibrations. The windows in my house vibrate when they fly over in various patterns, sometimes hovering, sometimes flying by, um, keeping the windows open or being in the yard in the warmer weather. Uh, it creates a tremendous annoyance. We can't hear ourselves talk to our friends. Uh, it's just so intrusive and so much of it and uh, it begins at sometimes seven in the morning and doesn't stop until the evening. It's virtually every day. During COVID, things may be different, but this has been going on for years and it's getting worse and worse. And I see no reason why uh, this is allowed at all. Uh, it's a type of recreation that's not necessary. We have wonderful boats that uh, encircle the city and go up the Hudson. You can walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. You can visit all the wonderful things in Brooklyn, taking the subway inexpensively. Uh, and it's just a horrible insult to the, uh, our right to uh, habitability, uh, so distressing and so annoying. Um, and it's endless. Thank you. I, Glad I got to say my piece about this. I can also say all of my neighbors agree. It's Thank you, kind of an outrage. You're welcome. Thank you. I believe we've uh, heard from all of our registered panelists. So at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I'll now turn it back to Chair Vallone for closing remarks. A personal thank you. Uh, look, you've all stayed on, uh, and that's, that's a testament to your passion about this industry. So, and what we need to do for getting on reclaiming our skies back. Um, when I first started back in 2013, uh, when I, I would go to the EDC committee hearings, this wasn't even really a topic that was brought up. And then in 2017, under Speaker Johnson, when I became chair, this became a 
quarterly or uh, biannual hearing where we've gotten to today. Uh, and at first we were all told there's nothing we can do because it's FAA. And now we have pieces of legislation that will have a direct impact. And I thank my fellow council members for signing on to the speaker for bringing these bills up today, which means they will be voted on in one of the upcoming stage of hearings. So you will have a victory in your hands for everyone who has suffered uh, and for everyone who has taken the time to do it on your own and put that data up and pass it around to communities who had no voice to be heard, I thank you for all of that. And for the folks that spent today in the industry working with me to, to carve out and make this next step. This isn't the end. This is the next step in an industry that is changing because now we're being heard. Uh, so I thank for my committee members, my staff who have gotten through uh, and passed these and get these bills out today. I thank you very much, and to my fellow council members, I look forward to uh, even more have signed on just from the today's hearing to getting it to the next state of hearing and getting voted and passed out the legislation to give uh, our brothers and sisters in New York City some relief. So with that, we close today's hearing, and I thank everyone for staying on.